Databricks has just made a very big announcement and that that is that they are jumping into the arena with open source LLMs. They've created their own LLM and this is called DBRX. Now, this is kind of interesting. I'm going to break down exactly benchmarking a few things about this, how you know powerful it is in comparison to let's say ChatGPT and specifically the versions of ChatGPT because there's a very interesting finding here. But let's get into um, everything that's going on in here. I'm going to show you a little bit about you know what is going on with this whole story. So the first thing is um, Obviously, this is big news. Um, this is going all over the internet. This is on a bunch of different platforms. There's some interviews and Ali Goshi, who is the CEO of Databricks, said at this whole press conference when they announced this, quote, we're excited to share DBRX with the world and drive the industry towards more powerful and efficient open source AI. While foundational models like GPT-4 are great general purpose tools, Databricks business is building custom models for each client that deeply understand their proprietary data. DBRX shows we can deliver on that. Okay, the thing that I really want to um, just make a note of, first off, I'm super, super pumped, not only that they're creating this, but that they're creating this open source. I'm really, really happy with Databricks and everything that they're doing here. But what I do wanna say is, you know, in the quote that you saw there, they're saying like, you know, GPT-4 is great for general purpose, but we're doing custom stuff. Yes, but also this is feels a lot like a corporate spin on the fact that no one can catch up to OpenAI and GPT-4. Um, you're going to see in the benchmarking what I'm talking about in a minute. But, you know, it, I'm not mad. I, I, it's, I think it's great and good for them and they're finding a, a need in the market. They're doing something open source. They're doing something powerful. But I just think it's very interesting that with all of these major companies spending billions of dollars in this field, no one is able to catch up with GPT-4. Really, I mean, you have Google that Gemini feels like it might have and Claude feels like it might have, you know, hit the same level, but GPT-4 came out a year ago, GPT-5 is around the corner, so did they really catch up is a question. Let's look at what they're doing here. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not pointing fingers at Databricks because whether they caught up or not, I think is irrelevant. They're doing something unique and different, which is great. So um, let's get into exactly what that is. The first thing that I wanna say when we're kind of looking at this whole announcement here is um, they've made a blog post about this on their website. A couple things that I that I noticed and that I wanted to point out, they have some interesting benchmarks. Um, they have some interesting, you know, things on how this work. But the thing that I want to point out is that this is a model with 132 billion parameters. Um, right now, they're saying that it can outperform um, Llama 270B, Mixtral in language understanding and some other areas. Um, and apparently what they're doing is deploying a quote, mixture of experts architecture. So for those that don't know what the mixture of uh, experts architecture is, this is exactly what GPT-4 is using. So I think this is smart. Essentially what it is, when you ask it a question, it doesn't have one model that answers the question. GPT-4 specifically, I'm not sure how many they have, but has 16 like experts within their model. So when you ask it a question, it has an AI that determines which of these 16 experts would answer it best. It shoots it there, they answer it. Okay, so that's, um, this seems like industry standard. This is what everyone's doing now. So yeah, hats off to them. They're in the mixture of experts architecture and they're using 16 sub models, um, but only four for each token for better efficiency. So they split it up a little bit different, but you know, I think that's kind of irrelevant. I do think it's interesting that they're doing 16 sub models, which is literally exactly what uh, OpenAI is doing. Not sure if they're copying them. Um, yeah, probably they're copying them. So what I will say now is that the like to actually develop this, this took about two months. It cost them about $10 million. Um, what I find fascinating here is right now we have, so again, like um, some kudos to Databricks. We have Apple who right now is in talks with getting Gemini to put onto their iPhones for um, answering certain tasks. What I think is super interesting about that whole kind of Apple Gemini story is that, um, is that, you know, Apple could have went and developed their own model. We have, you know, XAI who famously was able to go and create uh, Grok, their kind of ChatGPT competitor, and they did that in three months. And now we have Databricks that has created a ChatGPT competitor in two months, $10 million. It really begs the question, like, why is Apple not able to just crank something out on their own? Why do they have to do a licensing deal with Google Gemini with you know, they just wasted $10 billion on their car project that they canceled. Why couldn't they spend $10 million and a couple months and get something out that was, you know, like GPT 3.5, which is miles above Siri. But anyways, that's another conversation. I'm um, getting back into what, uh, getting back into specifically what we're seeing out of Databricks here. Um, they said that this is coming amongst, there's like a bunch of competition right now from Snowflake. Snowflake has Snowflake's Cortex um, and there's a bunch of other big cloud providers that are doing other AI services. I think this is a really interesting, um, an interesting thing that they're doing. Essentially, by open sourcing DBRX, they're trying to lead AI research and support 
um, for their own AI, custom AI model business, right? So making this open source attracts a lot of talent, attracts a lot of people to using their infrastructure. So I think this is really smart from Databricks. Um, their strategy right now includes hosting custom AI models trained on clients' private data sets, um, which is, you know, it helps to address security compliance concerns. Really what's happening here is they're saying, hey, look, we have this custom model. You can use this as your foundation. You can put your company's own data in here. Um, and yeah, now you have this really customizable open source model that your company can use. You're not worried about security. You're not worried about compliance. It's, you know, it's open source. So it's just yours. Um, and then of course, I'm sure this works into the whole ecosystem of everything else that Databricks is doing, right? Because they have the, like a lot of companies are storing and, and hosting data um, there. So yeah, I think this is a no brainer, a really, really good business move on Databricks's um, side, especially, yeah, Snowflake, Cortex, and a bunch of these big AI providers are trying to are trying to eat that market. So I think they, they realized, okay, if we can come up with our own AI model, um, then this is gonna be really, really, um, it, it's gonna help to lock our, our vendors in. So right now they're trying to attract data science talent. Um, and of course, this is something that has a lot of competition. So let's talk about what the model is actually able to do. Um, they did a couple benchmarks that I thought were very interesting. The first one is a language understanding benchmark. Um, that's the MMLU. And on that benchmark, Databricks scored 73.7. .7. This is compared to Llama 270B, who had 69, Mixtrol that had 71, Grok that had 73. So they, you know, were the best in those. Now, the question you might be asking is why was uh, GPT-5 or ChatGPT not included in this? Whatever, that's, <laughs> don't worry about that, right? So I'm assuming what happens is you go run your, your model through a bunch of different benchmarks and if you beat people, you just show the graph of you beating people. The other one that they did quite well on was um, human eval. This is for programming. They got 70%, Llama 70B only got 32%, Mixtro got 54%, Grok got 63%. So um, yeah, they're, they're pretty good. I guess uh, to be fair, in this comparison here, they're doing open source models. Grok recently just open sourced. Um, and so of course, Gemini and op OpenAI and, and uh, you know, or Ch ChatGPT, those are not open source. So I guess it's fair to say like they're winning in some of these open source benchmarks. So I'll give, it, I'll give that to them as well. Something else is math. So the GSM-86 benchmark for math, they scored 66.9. So let's just say 67%. Llama had 54%. Four percent. Mixtral had sixty-one. Grok had sixty-two. So um, it, honestly, it appears like they're doing quite well in a lot of these benchmarks. Now, when you actually put them toe to toe with GPT, OpenAI's offerings, they actually don't do too bad either. Now, what I'll say is they're only really benchmarking themselves against GPT three point five, which is you know GPT four came out a year ago, so it's kind of stretching it. Uh, personally, I don't like it when everyone shows their benchmark versus GPT 3.5, but since GPT-4 is the best and no one's been able to beat them, like it makes sense. Okay, whatever, I'll give it to them. Um, but uh, DBRX versus GPT 3.5 on the lane. Uh, so these are the th same three benchmarks on language understanding, 73 versus GPT 3.5's 70. On programming human eval, they got 70 versus GPT 3.5's um, 48. And on math, they got 72 versus GPT 3.5's 57. So they actually beat GPT 3.5. This is not a surprise. GPT 3.5 is getting completely smoked by GPT 4. So I think it's going to be obviously a more fair comparison to do that. But this is, you know, it's an open source project. This is brand new. They, they cranked this thing out in two months for $10 million. So I'm going to give them like a ton of... Um, a ton of credit for this. And then just talking about some of the other things, they had, a, they had a quote on their blog where they said, Databricks is a key partner with NASDAQ on some of our most important data systems. They continue to be at the forefront of the industry in managing data and leveraging AI. And we're excited about the release of DBRX. So this is coming from Mike O'Rourke, who's the head of AI and data service as, at NASDAQ. And I guess this is just kind of giving some testimonials for DBRX and what it's actually doing. He said, um, the combination of strong model performance and favorable serving uh, servicing economics is the kind of innovation that we are looking for as we grow our use of generative AI at NASDAQ. Okay, this is an amazing product. I'm going to be honest. I, like, I'm going to give uh, Databricks a big kudos for being able to pull this off. Two, million, two, two months, $10 million, lest anyone criticize them for having done it and like, oh, it could have been better. Okay, well, look at the trillion dollar Apple that has yet to create an LLM and launch it and replace the absolute garbage that is Siri. So I'm gonna give uh, Databricks some credit here. Obviously, OpenAI is still 
kind of running ahead of everyone on the field, but that is the nature of the game um, and kind of, you know, them being able to start first. So they, they push the furthest. It's going to be interesting to see where this goes. And I think they do have a custom serving, especially or offering, especially because they're open source. They are a data, you know, like the, the nature of um, how they how they host other companies' data and how that can plug into this LLM very seamlessly, I think, makes this a very compelling offering. Really excited to see where Databricks goes with this in the future. I will definitely keep you up to date on all of it.